Hello, and welcome to the Aguilar Conversations, a global perspective. I'm Tony Aguilar. On today's podcast, one of the most protracted conflicts today is the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Joining me today from Bethlehem in the West Bank is the Reverend Dr. Mitri Reheb, the founder and president of Dar al Kalima University in Bethlehem. He is the author of 40 books and is one of the most widely published Palestinian theologians. His latest book is Emerging Theologies from the Global South. Dr. Reheb is the recipient of the Tolerance Award from the European Academy of Science and Arts, the Olaf Palma Prize, and was also awarded the German Media Prize, which is normally awarded to heads of state such as former President Barack Obama, King Hussein of Jordan, and Nelson Mandela. In 2018, Dr. Reheb was elected to the Palestinian National Council and to the Palestinian Central Council. He joins me today from the West Bank. Dr. Reheb, thanks for joining me today. You are most welcome. You know, hostilities between the Palestinians and Israelis, they have their ebb and flow violence and the like, but it seems to be an increase of violence within the last several months, particularly in regards to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, where a lot of settlers are starting to come in. And my understanding is while they're allowed to, to come in, they're not supposed to pray there, but they are coming in to pray. And the other day, the defense minister has come in and it's causing a whole lot of tension. What is the cause of that particular uh, source of tension right now? Uh, actually, uh, the uh, you know the the attacks of uh, Jewish settlers on on Al Aqsa Mosque is just uh, one uh, symptom uh, of what's going on in our country, where basically uh, th uh, the Israeli uh, want to control the whole land. Uh, uh, with a kind of Jewish supremacy uh, over and against the Palestinian, the native people of the country. And uh, if we look today at the map uh, of historic Palestine, we can see that uh, over 90% of historic Palestine is either under Israeli military control or Jewish settler control. Though in historic Palestine today, we have 6.5 million Jewish people and 6.5 million, uh, million Palestinian people. So we have two groups, same size, but unequal control of land and resources. Uh, and where one group actually wants to be masters over another and use the other as uh, cheap labor when they need so. Uh, uh, our situation for an American audience uh, can be compared with two parallel uh, things that happened in the U.S. One is the settler colonialism that pushed actually the Native Americans into reservations. And if you want, Bethlehem is basically now a kind of a Palestinian reservations surrounded by 22 Jewish settlements that have taken 80 6% of Bethlehem land for Jewish use only, leaving the native population with only 14%. And the other, uh, and the other uh, experience from the US history is the segregation, where uh, uh, white uh, were actually segregated from the black and where blacks uh, people were pushed in areas with little or no resources uh, and where uh, they were used as uh, uh, as uh, cheap uh, labor. You've also compared the situation to uh, South Africa's apartheid. Uh, actually, uh, it's not me. It's uh, there are three uh, human rights organizations, or four actually. Uh, the first was a Jewish human rights organization, Beit Salem to call what's happening on both sides of the green line as apartheid, national human rights watch, and last but not least, Harvard School of Law. Uh, so, I mean, these are really uh, 
the professionals uh, who uh, were analyzing the context here and came to the conclusion, this is nothing but an apartheid with supremacy for one group over another and with a segregated system. So we have segregated roads. There are roads in Bethlehem that I cannot use with my car. I cannot drive on them. Though, I mean, this is uh, Bethlehem, right? Supposed to be part of the Palestinian uh, territory. Uh, in terms of freedom of movement, uh, the same thing in, in terms of uh, the, the right to build homes uh, in 50% uh, of the West Bank, uh, we are prohibited from that while Jewish settlers can uh, um, and are uh, actually building uh, like crazy. Now, part of that, uh, my understanding is that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is looking to actually annex the West Bank, which would be a violation of international law. What is going to be the response to that? Because the other thing was, my understanding is that the Supreme Court of Israel had deemed uh, settlers' settlements as unconstitutional. So what's going to be the response by the PLA and other organizations? You know, uh, actually, uh, 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 I'm not sure that Netanyahu will do it legally, what he's doing is there is land annexation uh, basically happening all the time, but without declaring it like that. So it's de facto annexation, so far not de jure, so it's not yet by law, because by law, this will create lots of problems. And basically, uh, uh, at least the US is against that, uh, at least until now. Um, but uh, in his coalition, uh, he uh, he really, uh, 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 I mean, in his coalition, they have uh, uh, in their agreement, in the coalition agreement, two things. Uh, first of all, that the Jewish people have exclusive and unquestionable right over all of historic Palestine, which means... Me as a Christian, me as a Palestinian, I have no right to be here. Uh, I'm tolerated for, for the meanwhile, but not more than that. So that's the first agreement in the coalition. The second sentence of Netanyahu uh, will make everything possible to uh, expand the building of Jewish settlements in all areas of historic Palestine. Uh, in the Negev, in the Galilee, in Jerusalem, and in the West Bank. Uh, so, so basically, annexation is taking place, but, uh, uh, you know, very quietly, though, I mean, it's not quiet at all because the building of, of settlements, people can see that, uh, I mean, day and night. You cannot not see that. One of the things to stay with the um, the apartheid example for a moment, the world population of many nations came in and began to support the black population and the getting rid of apartheid. That does not seem to be happening right now as the Palestinian plight seems to be forgotten. I mean, as the world is... Um, dealing with Ukraine and some are dealing with Sudan. The Palestinian plight does not seem to be on the top of anyone's agenda right now. So where are you in terms of gaining external support for the Palestinian population? Right. I mean, you, correct. You are correct. Uh, actually, uh, if you think of, of what's happening, uh, people there look at the situation and they see, you know, this is a Russian invasion of uh, of another country. It's an occupation of other, another country. It's an extension of another country. And everyone actually is saying, I mean, at least the Western countries, uh, this is not supposed to be, and we have to fight back and to give the Ukrainian what they need actually to liberate uh, their country. This is not happening with Palestine. Actually, because Israel is a Western if you want, 
uh, colonial project. I mean, uh, 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 the Israeli occupation uh, of, uh, of Palestinian land uh, continues for two reasons. One, because uh, the international community continued to provide Israel with the hardware, meaning, you know, all the latest equipment, the F-35 jets, the submarines from Germany, etc., and mainly for free. I mean, Israel receives $3.8 billion in aid per year from the U.S. alone. So that's the hardware. But also Israel uh, 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 is supported by the software that is produced, unfortunately, at many Christian seminaries, where many churches are uh, a reading from the Old Testament that says Israel, subconsciously they connect the Israel of the Bible with the state of Israel today. And so this actually uh, gives them uh, the feeling that they have to support this uh, state of Israel, while actually this state of Israel uh, 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 in incorporates everything that American values against. I mean, uh, you know, if, if you think of the American values of freedom, of liberty, pursuance of happiness, uh, I mean, this is actually what we as Palestinians are calling for. Uh, and yet uh, we see the international community uh, keep supporting the occupation of our land and people. And I want to stay with this point for a moment, then I want to come back to the actual conflict, because your new book, uh, Emergent Theologies, actually begins to challenge the pervasive narrative of who owns what land. So tell me, in your book, you're trying to get a different context for theology, similar to what Dr. James Cone, the late Dr. Cone, did with Black theology in the United States. What do you hope to accomplish with that book? And how do you think people will receive it? I mean, it's out now, but how will people react to it? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, to stay with the, with the image of the software, uh, uh, my intention is to crack that software. Uh, because, you know, that software is, is harming us the same way that that software was harming Black people. Uh, remember, the Bible uh, uh, was utilized, was weaponized, and is still being weaponized against Black people. Uh, you know, you have a quotation uh, from Genesis 9 that is used against Black people as well as against Palestinian, the same verse, you know, uh, and, and many other things. Uh, and we need to crack that software. Uh, uh, we need to provide a different lens of reading the Bible where justice actually is at the center of it. You know, the thing with the Bible, I always say that the Bible is, uh, is like the, the bazaar, uh, the market uh, in the old city of Jerusalem. In that market, you can find everything and anything you want. What you find there speaks not so much about the Bible, but about you want to have passages uh, about ethnic cleansing, you can find them. You go to the book of Joshua. It talks about ethnic cleansing. God himself is calling his, his people, you know, to uh, ethnically cleanse the native people, the Canaanites of Palestine, and not to leave even uh, a tree or an animal or, or a person living. So if you, if, if you are looking for those, and remember, this was done in North America, this was done in South Africa, this was done in Australia with native people. Yes, uh, you can find it. If you want to find texts that speaks of liberation, you can find them. You go to Luke 4, Jesus saying, you know, uh, you know I was sent to, you know, to, to, to liberate uh, uh, people uh, to uh, to heal uh, 
uh, the sick and to set the prisoners free. So, so what you find in the Bible actually talks more about you, uh, who you are, uh, what your values are. And so the question is, is the Bible a text of colonization or liberation? Is it a text that supports occupation or freedom? That's really an important question. And in that book, uh, actually, and I have a new book coming out in two months uh, uh, under the title Decolonizing Palestine, The Land, the People, and the Bible. Now, and that book will be coming out in September, and I want to broach on that as well. But I want to touch on another issue just to put it out there, as you know, because of how you interpret the Bible and how you see Israel and the like, some have deemed you anti-Semitic. Um, and that comes not only from Israeli officials, but American evangelicals. How do you respond to that? You know, uh, speaking uh, truth to power uh, comes with a price tag. And basically, those who 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 talk about uh, uh, anti-Semitism today, actually, they are the anti-Semite themselves, but they want actually to silence us. In fact, you know, I mean, uh, uh, those who attack me are mainly uh, uh, actually uh, Christian Zionists. Uh, I think they are uh, funded by the Israeli government basically to silence any uh, voice that speaks for justice. Uh, remember, uh, Martin Luther King's uh, message uh, had to pay a price. And not only him. Uh, I mean, uh, many of the leaders in this world who dare to speak truth to power. But uh, again, these Christian Zionists actually are the most anti-Semite people because they want uh, to bring all the Jewish people to Palestine so that two-thirds of the Jewish people will be killed in Armageddon and the last third will convert to Christianity. So basically they are calling for the annihilation of the Jewish people. It's not me who are calling for that. They are calling for that. But uh, they are so uh, blurred by a certain reading of the Bible that they believe that the divine rights actually trump human rights. For me, uh, human rights uh, cannot be separated from the divine rights. As Christians, we believe that uh, uh, God became human in Christ, in Bethlehem. And that incarnation actually tells us that uh, we cannot anymore uh, uh, attack human beings in the name of God, because God uh, actually stands with those who are oppressed. Uh, and uh, this is my message, and I stand uh, to that message. Uh, and really, uh, I don't care so much about what, uh, what these crazy Christian Zionists say. But just to piggyback on that, but how do you then decouple the idea, the legitimate criticism of governmental power, when you're talking about speaking truth to power, from the automatic fallback position, which is anti-Semitic or whatever it is you want to call it. Because there is room for legitimate discourse about policy. And if a people are being um, oppressed, that is something that needs to be addressed. So how do you decouple the notion of criticizing policy and say, well, that's not anti-Semitic for me to criticize what you're doing to my people. Right. I mean, anti-Semitism actually is dumping all Jewish people uh, and seeing them as inferior or whatever. That is the problem. And we have to be very careful uh, because uh, the Christian church, unfortunately, uh, especially in the West, uh, was demonizing the Jewish people for too long. Uh, and so that is anti-Semitism. But criticizing the state of Israel actually is something that is, uh, that is uh, uh, it's not only uh, 
uh, is called for by human rights, but also by the Bible itself, because no political construct construction uh, 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 should be given theological overcoat. Uh, once you do that, and you put any state over and above human rights, uh, actually, that is the most dangerous thing. Uh, because uh, this is what Hitler tried, and this is what many people uh, in other countries tried. Uh, it's something very dangerous. All political constructs should be, uh, you know, uh, analyzed and criticized if they uh, uh, abuse and violate human rights. Going back to the actual conflict, um, some would say that there may be too many people speaking on behalf of the Palestinian people. You have Hamas in the Gaza Strip, you have PLA, you have Fatah. Is that one of the obstacles to a solution uh, between the Palestinians and the Israelis, and maybe even Hezbollah you know, coming from outside? Does there need to be maybe one voice that speaks on behalf of the Palestinian people? Uh, I mean, uh, Hezbollah, first of all, uh, is not Palestinian, and uh, uh, I mean, uh, is uh, uh, Fatah and Hamas uh, uh, are uh, are divided. Uh, it is not a problem to have more than one party because I think this is a plus we have as Palestinians that we have eleven political parties. You have two in the states; we have eleven, and this is something healthy. Uh, it's actually a sign of, of democracy. The problem is that when, when Hamas controls one part and Fatah controls another part, uh, that is the problem. And this is why we are calling for uh, a, a united uh, Palestinian policy. Uh, but this is not the obstacle to peace because this division is only like 15 years uh, old. Uh, and and our problem is 75 years old, you know. This year's uh, commemorate 75 years of the Nakba, when 800,000 Palestinians were driven out of their homes, uh, were pushed out, were displaced and became refugees, and uh, 520 Palestinian villages were actually uh, destroyed fully and are no uh, more there. Uh, and for 60 years, actually, nothing was done to, to bring peace, uh, even when uh, there was only one Palestinian voice. The problem is that uh, uh, Israel actually uh, do doesn't want, uh, and, uh, uh, and they want to push the rest of the Palestinians from there. Uh, in recent years, we had the Abraham Accords. What's your take on those? Did that, because one of the critique of that is that it did not take into consideration the plight of the Palestinian people. Is that your assessment of it? Uh, yes. Uh, and actually, if you look at it, uh, uh, the Abraham Accord is, uh, um, uh, is a, a PR campaign, nothing more than that. Uh, uh, it is uh, it is uh, the idea uh, that uh, you know uh, to bring people in the Gulf region and in Israel uh, to cooperate on certain uh, economical things uh, by excluding the political factors, and nobody can actually exclude the political factors because Israel was never in war with the Gulf states was never in war with Morocco. The main issue for Israel is the Palestinian. And actually, there will be no, no peace for Israel without peace for the Palestinians. And there will be no peace for the Palestinians without peace for Israel. So, and, and, and using the word Abraham is actually, again, weaponizing the, the scripture for something that is not uh, uh, divine at all, not biblical at all. Now, but in terms of the eventual, hopeful, hopefully eventual resolution of the conflict and the liberation of the Palestinian people, 
can it happen with just the Palestinian representatives and the Israeli representatives, or does there have to be a third party in there as it was, for example, when George Mitchell uh, negotiated the Easter Agreement in, in the United Kingdom? So does a third party have to come in? Uh, yes, a third party is important. Uh, the third party do doesn't need to come in because the third party is involved already. I mean, you know, without the $3.8 billion that Israel received from the U.S., uh, Israel cannot do what they are doing. They cannot actually sustain the occupation. The problem is that the occupation is paid by the international community. And so the international community, including the U.S., is part of the problem. But they have the potential to be part of the solution. And so, yes, their involvement is important. So tell me, the solution in your your vision looks like what? I mean, we, we know what the situation is now. The Palestinian people are persecuted. They can't move from place to place. But what does the solution look like? And how do you begin to bring in the United States to begin thinking differently about the resolution? Which in I many mean, cases was this two state. I mean, there are five uh, viable solution models. Uh, one solution is this two, two state solution that was propagated for too long. But more and more people think maybe it's too late for a two state solution because you have uh, now hundreds of Jewish settlements on Palestinian land in the West Bank with over 800,000 Jewish settlers. So, how can you? actually uh, have a Palestinian state there. Uh, the second uh, uh, solution is a one-state solution. Uh, one person, one vote. Uh, uh, and more and more people actually uh, are uh, starting to believe in the solution. Uh, the problem is uh, maybe it's too late for a two-state solution, but unfortunately it's too early for a one-state solution. If, if they give up the two-state solution, they have to say that what happens here, what's happening here is apartheid, and the, and the international community does not want to use the word apartheid. They are uh, scared of the Israel lobby. So the third uh, solution uh, is a, a federation, uh, which means you have a federal state like the U.S. with different uh, sub-states, if you want, uh, 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 and but within a federal system. A fourth solution is a confederation, which means you have two states, Palestine and Israel, but they are united in a confederation, maybe together even with Jordan. The fifth solution is the Swiss solution, which is you have a federal state with cantons where every canton and has its own cultural and ling linguistic uh, uh, particularities, and yet they are uh, united in one uh, system with one uh, military and one government. Uh, uh, so these are the five solutions. If none of these solutions is implemented, which is unfortunately the case right now, we end up with a system of segregation uh, and apartheid. In your upcoming book, Decolonizing Palestine, what does that mean to you and how do you think that happens if the international community does not come in with a different um, framework of understanding the, the conflict that's there? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is, uh, it's not a conflict. Uh, th that's what I'm saying in the book. Uh, because conflict means you have two parties, more or less equal, and they are fight about something, they have disagreement. But this is not the case. The thing is, you have one party who has all the power, and they control the land and resources, and they developed a policing state to police those 
the others, the Palestinians, the native people. Uh, this is actually called today in, 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 in political science, uh, settler colonialism. Uh, it's when, when people come from abroad, actually, not only to, to occupy another group, but to replace them so that they don't exist anymore. They push them out of the country through many means. Uh, and so they, they, they slowly leave by, uh, by, by imprisoning them, uh, by uh, not allowing uh, their uh, kids to enter the country, uh, etc. So it's, it's, a set, it's a set of policies with the aim actually of pushing the native people out and replacing them with people coming from abroad. That is actually the, the situation that we are dealing with. We need people to understand actually what, the, what, what this situation is all about. Uh, that's, that's the first step. Second, we want them to, to decouple uh, this from the Bible, that what's happening here is not really what the Bible is prophesying. This is a modern conflict. Uh, this is a not conflict. This is a modern, uh, I mean, uh, uh, situation of of occupation and settler colonialism uh, that uh, we need actually to to be aware of. Uh, and third, we need to ask people where they stand. Uh, where they stand? Uh, are they on the side of? Uh, those who are oppressors or are they on the side of those oppressed? Uh, how do they understand governments in such a situation? On the side of the oppressor or on the side of the oppressed? I think uh, we, uh, you know, uh, liberation theology uh, in South America actually uh, taught us that uh, God stands on the side of the oppressed, uh, not the oppressor. And the question is, where do we stand as people of faith? Do we support the oppressors or we stand by God with the oppressed so that they are liberated and both then can live on equal footing with equality? Uh, and equality is something we cannot actually uh, compromise on. I mean, we cannot afford to have white people have more rights than black people, have Jews have more rights than Palestinian people. Equality is something that is basic for American values, for human values, and for biblical values. And all what we are calling for as Palestinians is equality. Equality in two states, equality in one state doesn't actually matter that much but we cannot compromise on our equality, on our dignity, and on our rights to have the right to pursue happiness uh, for us and for our children. You are one of the foremost theologians in the world, uh, let's, let's face it, and you do have a constituency both in the global south, but also in the United States amongst a lot of younger seminarians who see the situation as you do. Uh, there has been calls for disinvestment and the like, but how do you get this issue to emerge to the top of the political agenda and emanating out of Washington? For example, as you know, there's gonna be an election next year and that's gonna have some effect on what happens within the Middle East. How do you begin to raise the issue in the U.S., and also what you're thinking about how the American election can possibly go in 2024? Um, you know, for me, actually, uh, uh, the work uh, in the U.S. is very important because uh, the because of the political power of the US, I mean, it is the, the superpower. Uh, it is very much involved here with the support of Israel. Uh, 
but also because the history of the U.S. And I do it. I mean, I was just uh, last month in Washington, D.C., uh, meeting with uh, uh, members of Congress uh, to share uh, with them actually what's happening here uh, from a Palestinian Christian perspective. You know, many, many people in Congress, they don't know even that there are Christians in Palestine. Uh, they don't know that Bethlehem today is a kind of reservation. They don't know that uh, there has been the, the incitement and attacks of Jewish settlers on Christian shrines in Jerusalem has uh, quadrupled uh, in the last uh, in the last few months, four times more than the year before. So sharing these stories uh, is important with Congress. So that's the first uh, level. The second level is working with churches because uh, actually members of Congress are more interested to hear from those uh, who have uh, uh, right, uh, 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 who have the right to vote in their, uh, in their areas because you know they have votes and their votes count more than my voice. And so we have to, 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 to support churches so that they can raise this issue to their constituency. And the third level is to work with the uh, Jewish community in the U.S. because within the U.S., many Jewish people, especially the young people, uh, are fed up with the state of Israel. Uh, they believe now that the state of Israel actually is a source of headache for them because, you know, it's against all the values that uh, American Jews were fighting for uh, in the States. Uh, and so they don't accept that. And this is a very important group of people because at the end of the day, uh, 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 you know, uh, to work with, with the Jewish constituency, our problem is not with the Jewish people. Our problem is with the state of Israel that is actually, uh, uh, that has put in its, uh, uh, in its uh, uh, policy and coalition agreement uh, issues uh, of supremacy and apartheid and exclusion. And we want a, a Palestine uh, uh, that really, uh, uh, that uh, is pluralistic, uh, that has place for the two peoples and the three religions. But we will not accept that our country will be for one group of people and one religion and not, uh, you know, uh, and we lose that uh, pluralistic and inclusive nature that is important for uh, this country. Given the political realities on the ground and everything, going on around the world. Are you hopeful that we will see a resolution to the persecution of Palestinians within your lifetime? Uh, I'm not sure, actually. Uh, but uh, I'm not optimistic, uh, but I'm hopeful. Uh, because optimism has nothing to do with hope is to look and see that uh, liberation is coming soon. Unfortunately, it's not coming soon. But I tell you, it is coming. Uh, you know, the, the, the gospel freedom is coming. Uh, freedom is coming to Palestine as well. Uh, uh, what is amaz amazing is that, you know, uh, Israel every few months uh, you know, they assassinate uh, some of Palestinian political leaders. And, you know, the next generation comes uh, and fight back uh, and does not give up. That resilience, Israel is not going actually uh, uh, to get rid of the Palestinian resilience. Our people uh, have this resilience that actually... Uh, you know, they endure 
uh, you know, I mean, the African American people for 400 years, they were enslaved. And at the end, you know, they got their equality because, you know, <laughs> equality is something, uh, freedom is something that is coming. Uh, though sometimes we believe it takes too long. I mean, 400 years of slavery is too long. 100 years of Nakba is too long. Uh, but uh, freedom is coming, and I'm very certain of that. Uh, will that come during my lifetime? I'm not sure. But I'm hopeful, and, uh, you know, uh, in the States, we have a 501c3 uh, called Bright Stars of Bethlehem. And Bright Stars of Bethlehem, the tagline uh, that I coined uh, says, hope is what we do. It's not what we see, is what we do. If you come to Bethlehem, you visit our university, the first and only university of arts and culture and design in all of Palestine, you cannot be but hopeful. Uh, because of what we do, because when I see what our students are doing, the films they are producing, the design uh, they are making, uh, the songs that they are uh, putting together, the, uh, the theater uh, and plays that they are performing, I see the next generation of creative leaders is rising in Palestine, and uh, they are they will not give up until actually they achieve equality, they achieve freedom, they achieve liberty, and uh, they, they, they have their dignity. My guest today has been the Reverend Dr. Mitri Reheb, founder and president of Dar al Kalima University in Bethlehem. And he is the author of Emerging Theologies from the Global South. And I want to thank him for joining me today. And thank you for listening. And join us again next week as we deal with another issue of international interest here on the Aguilar Conversations, a global perspective. The Aguilar Conversations, A Global Perspective, is produced by Casa Margo Communications Group.